Okay. Okay, well, I'm really pleased um, to be here. I'm enjoying, um, I'm enjoying all these experiments in web communication as, you know, when you're as old as I am, you have this skeptical feeling that nothing will ever work. And um, anyway, I think this is an interesting experiment. Um, I'm also, with my talk, trying to conduct an experiment. The, in a way, it's a natural follow-up to um, Susanna's piece. She's asking, what, what is it that, uh, what are the risks that one's perceiving? Um, I'm talking about that. Um, in a, what I want to ask, as my title says, is um, what is it that one's, what is the communication that we're talking about? What are we trying to communicate about? And if I can, do, well, <laughs> that wasn't too good. Help! All right. Let's see if I can get back to the beginning of my talk. I think maybe I'll use, well, I'll try this one more time. Yeah, okay, that's one slide. Um, I should start out with a disclaimer. I'm here under false pretenses. I am neither an expert on risk communication nor on nanotechnology. And, um, but I do have a perspective on what might, might be interesting for thinking about communication, and I want to pursue that. And it comes out of some work that I've done with a gr bunch of colleagues whose names I would like to mention, um, partly our group at Clark, partly some others. They include Dale Haddis, Roger Kasperson, Vicki Beer, David Hausensall, Seth Tuller, and Heidi Larson. Um, none of them saw this talk, nor is at all responsible for it. But the ideas and the starting point are um, a collaborative effort. And what we've been considering, what our project was, was thinking about what the implications are for risk management as opposed to assessing risk, describing risks of situations with high uncertainty. So that's, that's what I'm bring, trying to bring into the discussion. And if I can figure out how to do this one at a time, yes. Um, as a non-expert in risk communication, I think as part of fairness I should tell you um, my mental model, if you'd like, of risk communication. And if there are two straw men that I would like to mention. One I call traditional communication, in which um, risk assessors, in some sense, have um, all the fun and none of the responsibility. A risk assessor gets to say everything, tells it to the managers, and then the managers do the right thing and take responsibility. And by the way, we communicate all this with stakeholders. Um, the second straw man evolved over time, which says, well, actually, maybe people should be talking amongst themselves and the term is, was coined um, in the National Academy Committee, was an analytic and del deliberative process. And you have this process, and maybe or maybe not, it influences whatever decisions are being made. So you can have communication, I mean, in my simple terms, you can have communication with participation or without. Neither of these models is particularly apt for a um, dynamic concern like nanotechnology 
where the issues keep changing, the knowledge base keeps changing. They're both, sub you know, static pictures that sort of imagine that you know what you're doing. Um, but I'm not, I'm not going to try to fix these problems with it. This is, those are the ideas I want. Okay, the problem I am concerned with is what it is that you communicate when, and now I have to read this because it's sort of complicated. One, you don't know whether some application of nanotechnology is a hazard. Or worse, you might not even know what sort of a hazard it might be when you don't know whether or not it's a hazard. This um, sentence, which I had to read, I'm sure those of you who teach communication tell people never to write sentences like that. At least I hope you do. And, um, but it gets at a problem. There's a, I mean, I'm trying to get at the fact that there's really a lot you don't know. And it's much broader than not being able to answer some specific question. It's that you don't even know how effectively to describe the context of the problem. Now, that wouldn't be so bad, perhaps, in one sense, because most people don't really care about the de these detailed nature of the hazard, which some of us love. They want to know, what are you going to do about it? And they want to have some assurance that you know what you're doing when you're doing that. Oh, dear. I'm not good at this. OK, one thing. One more. OK. And that's how we get to risk management. What are people going to do about it? And what capabilities do they have to do with it? And what our group has been arguing is that there are th three modes of risk management that we think are of particular interest, particularly appropriate in situations of very high uncertainty. And the three modes we call adaptive management, standard term which has now emerged from managing ecological systems, um, whose essence is that you don't make all the management decisions initially. You set up a program so you keep track of what's happening and you adjust your responses based on your findings. A second, that, that still presupposes though that you know what the problem is you're trying to manage. It's just you don't know exactly how to do it and you can adapt. The two other modes we want to examine are cases where you don't really know what the problem is. And in one case, maybe you can rethink what the problem is. And, um, oh, I was supposed to give you examples of these. For adaptive management, as I say, it came out of ecosystems. There's been a fair amount of experience of trying to set up adaptive programs along um, the legacy of the weapons complex, the program called um, nuclear stewardship. Um, we've argued, on many, going back for many years, that radioactive waste is an appropriate um, arena in which that kind of management makes more sense. That's not official policy. Official policy, and as I come to redefinition, I can now say what we want to do is redefine the problem. Official policy uh, 